So do I have a volunteer to come up and sketch this for me on the number line? Anybody feel like you can do that? This is your first chance to have a marker in your hand for a long time. Come on. this for me and you know what bring a friend if you want you never have to come by yourself so if you need a friend bring a friend just just color that in on the number line Nicely done, man. Thank you very much. Anybody have a question about that? You all feel perfectly comfortable with that concept? Awesome. Then today we're going to talk about a couple other things that I think you're just as comfortable with. One of the things we're going to talk about are the properties. Now when I say that word to you, we're going to talk in math class about the properties. What pops into your head? <coughs> Additive inverse. Perfect. And I'm going to go ahead and at the same time talk about the multiplicative inverse because they go together. Multiplicative inverse. They go together. Hey, do you remember what the additive inverse property says or does? Does anybody? She remembered the name. That's awesome. Anybody? Michael? That is awesome. That's not this property. That's another property. I'll use that as an example. Does anybody remember what property he just said? Did you hear him? Say it again, Michael. What, what, what did you say? So you can add 9 plus 5 or 5 plus 9, so both equal 14. So 9 plus 5 equals 5 plus 9. What property is that? That's commutative. That's called the commutative property. The commutative property says that you can add or multiply, this is add or multiply, in either order. So 9 plus 5 is 5 plus 9. That's his example. Perfect. P times Q equals Q times P. There it is for multiplication. That's the commutative property. All right, well, this is good. Can you think, maybe you don't know what these are. Can you think of any other properties? Like Michael did commutative. Can you think of any other properties? Either the property itself or the name of it. What? What? Reflexive. Aha, uh -huh, that's a property of equality, and that's awesome. And I'm, I'm not requiring you to know that one right now. But you're right, the reflexive property says A equals A. You used it all the time in geometry class when you were doing your proof. I've got five in mind that I really want you to focus on right now. This is one, they kind of go together. This is certainly one. When you say commutative, come on people, what automatically pops into your head? What's the other one, the one that goes with commutative? Oh my gosh, it starts with an A. Associative. Associative. The associative property. Can anybody think what associative means? And that would work for addition or multiplication also. Can anybody re remember what does associative do? <coughs> Commutative changes the order. What does associative do? Yeah. You move the parentheses. So you regroup. So you can, if you have, if you have to add 5 plus 3 plus 9, if you have to add those three numbers together, you either add the 5 and the 3 first, 
and then put in the nine, or you add the three and the nine first and then put in the five. Notice, did the order of the numbers change? No. In associative, the only thing that changes is the way you group them. Now, because I'm a math teacher and I've signed a contract that says I'm gonna do everything I can to make it as tricky as I possibly can, there will be, that's a joke by the way, there will be a question that looks like this. Which property is this? Commutative. Do not be fooled by the parentheses. Don't think that every time you have parentheses, you have associative. That's not it. What does associative do? Regroups. What's grouped here? B and C. What's grouped here? B and C. I did not regroup. What did I change? The order. And when the order changes, it is commutative. Okay, yeah. Oh yeah, you certainly could. Well, that would be, you would just have to list both properties. An example of that would be, let's say I had this, and then I did this. Um, that would be both. Both things are happening there because I changed the order and I have different things grouped. Now, when I ask you questions, there will be one property that you identify. So I wouldn't ask you to do that, but you could, obviously we can do that. That's true. All right, so we got commutative associative. We've never done the inverses yet, so let me just help you out here. Another word for additive inverse is opposite. And it would look like this. Seven plus negative seven is zero inverses cancel each other out. That's what inverses do, they undo each other. So a positive seven is undone by a negative seven. They switch, okay? And then, well, you are like the luckiest duck ever. Were you in another one of my problems? Yeah. here. Now, what do you think multiplicative inverse? What would that look like? The multiplicative like three times zero? No, that's actually called the zero product property. But actually, no, it's not. It's called the multiplicative property of zero. But no, the multi what, how can you multiply and cancel out? So what would I multiply times seven to make it cancel out? Seven times what? Zero. One seven. Seven times one seventh. Another word for multiplicative inverse is reciprocal. So if I said to you, what is the multiplicative inverse of three fourths? You would say four thirds. If I said, what is the additive inverse of three fourths? You would say negative three fourths. The additive inverse is just the opposite. The multiplicative inverse is just the reciprocal. Okay, so we got the inverses. All right, there's two more properties we need to talk about. Normally, one pops into your head right away. It's probably the one you've used the most. Commutative, associative, and what's that third one? It starts with a D. Distributive. The distributive property is probably the one that you use the most. Can someone give me an example of the distributive property? What does it look like or do? Oh, 
must make one up. Let's say three. Uh, Pretend you're a math teacher. Just make it up. Okay. Six. How about x plus y? Does that help you? How about yeah. just x plus y? There you go. So what would the distributive property say about this? 3x plus 3y. You are distributing, right? Maybe when you were little, you actually drew the arrows to remind yourself that 3 is going to be distributed to both numbers. Now, here's what I want you to keep in mind. The distributive property, like all the properties, works both ways. So, question on the quiz says, what property is this? You will say distributive. This is a factoring problem, but factoring is distributive in reverse. Do you see that? So you've got to recognize that you can go both ways. This is an example of the distributive property. And the last one, so there's one, two, three, four, the fifth property are the identities. The additive identity and the multiplicative identity. Anybody want to hazard a guess as what those properties look like? No guesses? What? Three times one is three is a perfect example of the multiplicative identity. What does it mean to be an identity? It means when you do the operation, nothing changes. It stays identical. So how do you leave everything the same in multiplication? You times by one. How do you leave everything the same in addition? You add zero. So the additive identity says if you add zero, nothing changes. The multiplicative identity says if you times by one, nothing changes. Okay? So, quick little exercise. I'm going to come around and check your pink sheet. While I'm doing that, I want you to see if you can identify these properties and then I have a simplification for it to do. All right. I just want you to write down what properties you see up here.
I'm not quite that old until I graduated from high school. I didn't start teaching until 81. Hey, it doesn't matter when the biology goes up. All right, what property is this? That's your distributed property. Good. What property is this? Multiplicative inverse. Very good. Reciprocal. How about this one? Multiplicative identity. Very good. How about this one? Oh, didn't catch anybody. That's the commutative property of addition. Super. How about here? Distributive. Distributive. Yep. Factoring is distributive. Perfect. How about here? Associative. That's your associative property of addition. How about this one? Commutative. Of multiplication. This is commutative of multiplication, right? Did everybody catch that? What changed? This set 3z and this says v3. Can I multiply in either order? Are they the same thing? Yes. When I change the order, it's commutative. Very, very good. Now, what about this? By the way, if you don't know those five properties, you need to get them down. Okay, we're not going reflexive, symmetric, transitive, all that stuff now. These are the five I want you focused on. Okay? This was a cheap shot on my part. We haven't talked about this, but maybe you remember. Do you remember anything about simplifying things that look like that? What do you remember, Griffin? Negatives. Oh, I thought, were you nodding, Griffin? I thought you were nodding. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah you're showing me. Um, what do I do with negative exponents? Well, I put them on the bottom, unless they're already on the bottom. If they're already on the bottom, then they go to the top. 
negative exponents switch places. So this x to the third is going to go to the bottom, and this x to the fourth is going to go to the top. Anything with a negative exponent switches position within the fraction. So y to the fifth is going to stay, but y to the seventh is going to go up. Z to the eighth is going to stay, and Z to the fifth is going to stay. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so now we gotta put stuff together. I got two X's. How is that going to simplify? One X on the top, I love it. One X on the top. You have four X's on the top and you have three X's on the bottom. The top has one more X than the bottom does. They're gonna cancel. X, 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 X over X, X, X. Leaving you with one X on the top. Beautiful. Now look at your Y's. They're side by side. So what's that gonna be? Y to the 12. Think about it, groupies. You have five Y's and seven Y's. All together then, you have 12 Y's. And what about your Z's? You've got eight of them on the top and five of them on the bottom. So we have Z to the third. And there's nothing on the bottom. I really don't need that line on there because everything that I does not move. Anybody get that one right? Good, 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 good. Anybody who didn't get it right have a question about it? Because now I'm going to give you a harder one. All right, let's try a little harder one. How about? so many cool things about math, I hate to say this, that there's one that's the best thing, but I really think the best thing about math is that you can do every problem in many different ways. So there are lots of ways to approach this problem. Ultimately, we're all going to get the same answer. You have to jump in and do something. So what is your thought? What? Distribute the negative two. Distribute the negative two. So she's saying distribute is probably not the right word, but I know exactly what you mean. You mean take everything in here to the negative second power. Now, is she allowed to do that? Would that be the, yes, she is, absolutely. Would that be the way you all might start the problem? No, but we're going with her, she volunteered. So we're going to take everything to the negative second power, including the two and the three. Do not forget about them. They're inside that parentheses, so they're going to the negative second. Now, what happens when I take an x to the negative third to the negative second? What do I do with these exponents? Multiply. I multiply, so that's going to give me a handy dandy x to the sixth. All right, what's going to happen here? Y to the negative 14. Everybody good on there? Now I'm going to the bottom. I already did the 3. So, okay, now what about my X's? X to the negative 8. And Y to the 
negative 10. Is everybody so far so good? And again, you may not have started this way. That's fine. We're starting this way. All right, what do you want to do next, Cassie? There's no wrong answer. I mean, lots of stuff still has to be done. You can do whatever order you want. Take care of all the negatives. So anything that's got a negative exponent is going to move. So this is going to the bottom. This is staying going to the bottom. Going to the top. Going to the top. Going to the top. of each other. Who has the most? The top or the bottom? How many more does the bottom have? So I have y to the fourth on the bottom. If I were to give you that quiz question, would you be able to get through it? Maybe not necessarily in exactly that order. Did anybody think about, right from the beginning, flipping the fraction over? I, I always do that because that's what this negative is going to do. When you put the negative on a fraction, everything on the top goes to the bottom, everything on the bottom goes to the top, so it effectively flips the fraction. That's how I start, but this is beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. All right, I've got two more things to talk about. The first one is scientific notation. What do you think of when I say the word scientific notation? So something like 4.8 times 10 to the 6, right? Now what's the rule for scientific notation? Can I have just any number I want out here in front? No. What about this number right here? It has to be between 1 and 10, right? If the exponent's positive, it means I have a bigger number. If the exponent's negative, it means I have a smaller number. So where do we run into problems with this? You guys have done so many of these in chemistry class, you're probably like, eh, I don't want to do it anymore. Let's take 4.8 times 10 to the 6, and let's multiply it by 6.4 times 10 to the 5th. Now when I do that, this is all multiplication. Multiplication is commutative and associative. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply the 4.8 times the 6.4. And I get 30.72. I have 10 to the 6th times 10 to the 5th. That will be 10 to the 11th. Are you okay with that so far? Would you put this in the answer blank? No, because see this number right here? Is it between one and 10? So I gotta make it between one and 10. So 3.072. And this is where the confusion comes because nobody ever knows what to do with the exponent. We get confused. Now, this number has to be the same as that one. When you went from here to here, you made your number smaller, right? You got smaller? So if everything's gonna stay the same, if this half of the problem got smaller, this half of the problem is gonna have to get bigger. So instead of 10 to the 11th, this is gonna be 10 to the 12th. 
if this half of the number got smaller, then you've got to balance it out by making this part of the number bigger. Let's try a division like that. How about um, 5.3 times 10 to the negative 8 over uh, 6.9 times 10 to the So for some reason, we need to do this division problem. So I'll take 5.3 and divide it by 6.9, and I get 0.768. Okay. I have a negative 8 on top and a 4 on the bottom. I can't have a fraction in scientific notation, so I'm going to have to subtract my exponents and get negative 12. Are you okay with that? Negative 8 minus 4. Remember when you divide, you subtract exponents. So negative 8 minus 4. Are we okay with that? Now take a look at that number. This isn't okay. I'll have to make it 7.68, won't I? Now, what happened? I made this number bigger which means this is going to have to get smaller. Now be careful. What's one smaller than negative 12? Negative 13. We're in negative land. If this part got bigger, then this part's going to have to get smaller. say a word, two words, that I hope you remember. Distance formula. Tell me what you think of when I say distance formula. X1 squared? No, X1 plus X2 squared. Or square root of X1 plus X2. Okay, it's a big square root. Of X1 plus X2 squared. Uh, and then X1 plus Y1 minus Y2 squared. That's it. That's your distance formula. P equals. That's it. Now. We're not going to get all hung up on these dumb subscripts. These little numbers here are called subscripts. We're not going to get all hung up about those. Remember, the context of every single one of these problems will be there are two points, and for some reason, you want to know how far apart they are. What is their distance? You're always going to have two points, so you're always going to have two x's and two y's you need to subtract the x's, you need to subtract the y's. I'm not worried about which one's x1 and which one's x2. It's not important. I'm going to subtract my x's, so I'll have 1 minus 3. I'll subtract my y's, 2 minus negative 4. I square those and add them up, so what have I got? 1 minus 3 is... Negative 2 squared is 4. 2 minus negative 4, 6. Squared is 36. Square root of 40. What do you think about the square root of 40? 40 is reducible. So we want to break it down. Do you remember how to do that? When you break it down, it doesn't matter how you start, but you, you, know, you start with 8 and 5. 
and then go to four and two, and then go to two and two. So you've got two, 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 and five. Two root ten is exactly right. Now some of you are going to think about this right from the get-go as four times ten. And you're going to say the square root of four is two. That's another way to get two root ten. But the idea is if you have two, 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 and five, which is what we've got for this number, every group of two comes out. And if it's not a group of two, it stays in. You all right with distance? All right. <coughs> Every time in your life you've talked about distance, and this is the third time because you did it in geometry and you did it in algebra two. Every time you talk about distance, what do you also talk about at the same time? It starts with an M. Midpoint. Always talk about them together for some reason. So let's look at my example here, my two points, A and B. Suppose I said find the midpoint of A and B. Anybody remember how that works? And before you say anything, I want you to think about Let's say on test one, you got an 80, and on test two, you got a 90. When I figure your grade, because that's, yeah, that's all you've got are those two grades, an 80 and a 90, I'm going to find the middle value of those two grades, aren't I? Isn't that how your grade's going to be calculated? And how do I do that? How do I find the middle value? I add them and divide by two. When you do the midpoint bid, all you're doing is finding the average. That's it. Midpoint is average. So what is my average x value? I have a 1 and a 3. What is the average of 1 and 3? Well, average of 1 plus 3 is 4 divided by 2 is 2. So your x value is 2. What about your y value? You have a 2 and a negative 4. What's the average or the middle of 2 and negative 4? Negative 2 divided by 2, which is negative 1. Midpoint is an average. You add and divide by 2. You need to remember that idea because especially when we get to our trigonometric graphing, we're going to be using that concept a ton. Midpoint is nothing but the average. It's the middle value, the average. You add and divide by two. You should be able to do all of P1 at this point and part of P2. So you've got the weekend to do it. We're done for the day. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Uh, whoever's over there, if you need to stop right now on the video.